What up? Quentin, Idiot Reads and Rambles, coming at you with the Whatever Day Reads from the Black of Night. Um, the Dead of Night, I should say. Um, standing in a bunch of wet stuff. So, what's going on with this video? I'm just going to ramble on about stuff, stuff I've read. Um, just to get something out there and because I want to recommend a couple books, you know. Um, first thing is uh, an, an, an amphetamine sulfate book called Stricter by Isabel Niku. I was gonna do an episode of the Rhubarb Chronicles on this, but thing is, I didn't actually care for it that much. You know, I it started out, I was very interested and I was like, holy crap, there's so much here. I'd love to get into this, right? Kind of about the way that like, um, this language that was imposed on the narrator, it's, uh, it's auto fiction, right? It's a kind of eye novel. Um, this language that was imposed on the narrator then kind of straights her agency in the world then she can't like then all her choices are sort of informed by this language that, that she built that she's built up very interesting stuff i was fascinated by that but there comes a point where it's kind of focused on a lot of freudian sort of um what do you say electric complex um wants to girl wants to have sex with the father kill the mother right um she the narrator has this a professor who is supervising her when she's doing her doctorate, I believe, her, one of her theses, anyways. Um, and she falls in love with this person. There's nothing really going on with him um, sexually, but uh, she kind of imposes that in some spots. But, you know, very interesting stuff, really interesting language, uh, interesting point of the book. I just thought that it got really tedious as it went on, and I was really wishing more. Um, from that book even though there is quite a quite a bunch of good stuff especially with the way the echoes work uh how uh, it talks about like um i think it talks about like mis like misquoting as a type of violence and that like if you misquote a text you're doing it violent so obviously there's some stuff going on with the king lear um quotations and misquotations that's going on right um that whole freudian thing is imposed with the cordelia thing um, there's a lot going on there, but again, I just found the, the reading experience to be too tedious to really um, give too much of a damn about it. You know what I mean? Um, it's unfortunate because there was a lot going on that was interesting at first, and I do want to get back to it and see what happens, but before that, I'm going to read the other amphetamine sulfate books I got. Um, Four Circles by Meg McCarville and um, um, Audrey Shaj, uh Invisibility, a Manifesto. Yeah, I'm going to read those first. Uh, but what else did I read? This is the one I really wanted to recommend. Problem is, I can't do a video on this one because I just don't understand it. Um, it, is a, it is a quintessentially Japanese book. Uh, it is called Masks by uh, Fumiko Inchi. And this book is freaking incredible. It is a sort of about um, the influence of these kind of colossal figures in Japanese uh, literary history as well as cultural history, right? Because you have Genji, and Genji is written by Murasaki Shikibu, Lady at Court. All of these classics are written by high-ranking ladies, and these ladies cast a shadow way over uh, Japanese literature. This book is reckoning with that shadow. It outright references um, Genji. It references, it references Tale of Ise. If you're interested in those, um, definitely check it out. Um, I One person told me they found my videos because this uh, this book uh, they were seeking out Shonagon from there. And Shonagon, to my knowledge, doesn't appear in the book. But uh, great, great book. Um, really starts very slow, but with the symbolism is perfectly done. Um, how, and, and no theater, of course, figures in it. Uh, a very prominently slow book, meditative book, uh, hypnotic book. Uh, it's a mysterious book. It's an enigmatic book. And it's very placid, you know, until the end when you realize that there's uh, been some incredibly messed up stuff that's gone on. It's, a, it's an incredible reveal and it is searing, cutting towards the end. Um, it is about two people who want this one girl. They, want, both want, they both want this girl named Yasuko, right? And um, Yasuko is, her husband has died climbing Mount Fuji. You can already see the sort of symbolism going on, how big Mount Fuji's literature is, right? Uh, and this guy has had, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you any of, that, any of that part of the story because it's a mystery that unfolds and you want 
you want to be there when it's unfolding, believe me. This is an incredible piece of work. Uh, but Yasuko's husband, her, his mother, has, is really interested in possession. You know, in um, uh, one person's spirit inhabiting another person's body of scenes at seances, right? And that is the sort of vessel through which this... Uh, through, the, through which this cultural re reflection takes place. The, uh, these people uh, study spirit possession. And Yasuko inherits her husband's work on spirit possession. And I think her husband inherits uh, her, his mother's work on spirit possession. So it kind of goes from the mother to Yasuko. And our main characters also study spirit possession in different ways. Uh, this is important. Right? Um, of course, the, the possession scenes in Genji are really there the, the roku jo haven is huge there's an essay part essay part memoir in the book that is about this relationship between this this person this mother of the guy who died uh and the roku jo haven and what's going on with them there is a lot of evil that is being covered up by this mother-in-law she is a really interesting figure i'm going all over the place i'm sorry but this mother-in-law her name is maiko or uh Meiko, i think and she is uh, kind of representative of, I think, the influence that Murasaki Shikibu has, where she can bend events towards her will without ever seeming like the, like she is sort of actively making that event happen. You know what I mean? Things just seem to pan out her way all the time. Yasuko feels like she doesn't have her own agency a lot of the time, like she's just um, being manipulated by Mako. Mako is very proper, in terms of like the standard Japanese woman of the, woman of the time, she is uh, a huge figure that just casts her shadow over all the characters in the book. And when you go, understand what's going on with her backstory and what she's trying to do, it is uh, demented. And that, that symbolism that she stands in for old Japan is particularly effective because it's like, it's, it's, you think that the men in this story um, as Japanese literature progressed, and I've spoken about it on the channel, the Meiji era literature is very male. Um, the uh, court poetry of the time was basically completely uh, male, I believe. Um, whereas novels weren't. So male influence in Japan predominated after that, but there has still been this ideal woman that's been sort of saved and, and honored, and people try to steer um, modern women are steered towards that, right? But men are also completely powerless in this sort of, how do you say it? In this sort of influence because they can't understand the great power that this stuff has over the tradition, if that makes any sense. Uh, and they are, they are the prey of it. It can make the decisions and they have, their agency is sort of counterfeit. You know what I mean? There's a lot going in this book. I don't fully understand it myself, but I would love to reread it in about a year or so and see what I get, because this was an incredible piece of work. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the ways that she'll set scenes and she'll end scenes with like the feeling of cold concrete seeping up into this person's uh, foot. That is just very. It's classic Japanese literature. It is incredibly good, incredibly quiet, disturbing read. Um, and monumental, I think. Even though it is so slim, it is so plain spoken. There's a lot of subtlety here. You'll want to check that out. Uh, I absolutely think that, that is, uh, it's genius. And I don't, com I don't feel comfortable like explaining exactly what I think of it right now, right? Characters well done. The plot is incredible. It starts a little slow, but stick with it. Um, Holy crap, the, the plot is great. Uh, yeah, uh, the symbolism on point. Um, the insights on point. I haven't, I haven't put everything together, but I get a great deal of it, I feel. Um, I don't have it in front of me because I just wanted to dash off a video. So I, this is where I would normally read some great spots from that book, but I don't really feel like it, to be completely honest. Truth be told, I've been in a bit of an identity crisis with the channel because I don't want to do uh, videos in sort of that vein that I've been doing them thus far, you know? I don't want to be doing stuff that fits into, like, these kind of, like, strict boxes, you know?
because I, I don't want this to be a kind of channel that the formalities of booktube kind of disgust me i'll put it like that and you know this is not a guy making content this is a guy just saying shit about books he likes um and doing book discussions of a singular book has just seemed to me kind of not exactly what i'd like to do so i'll figure it out but until then you'll get another whatever day reads and i just neatly uh, neatly, I don't know, it, 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 fits, it fits the box, this type of video. But do read Masks, absolutely. And the last thing I read, uh, Dun Dun's Holy Sonnets. Of course, I read some of Pamphylia to Amphilanthus by Lady Mary Roth. Roth. Um, that's great. Uh, check out Pamphylia to Amphilanthus. You can probably find it for free online. Same with Holy Sonnets. Holy Sonnets are very short. I think it's like 19 sonnets. They're quite good. Um, yeah, they're mostly great, I think. I've uh, been digging into Philip Sidney's sonnets even deeper, and holy crap, that is a dense sequence. Um, Astrophil and Stella, it's dense, man. Like, everything in that first poem is, like, like whole new poetics he's embarking on, which actually was radical for the time, to look in thy heart and write. It was very radical for the time. Um, there's a nationalism to his poetics that I'm going to get into in a discussion of the whole thing. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about John Dunn's Holy Sonnets. These are great. You know, it's done. So what are you going to get with Dunn? You're going to get some really surprising symbols. Um, the language, the linguistic fields that he operates within are very interesting. Um, batter my heart, three-person God. Um, he says he's uh, something like, nor ever, he's nor ever chased unless you ravish me. Right? Um... That is very much the type of symbolism John Donne goes for. Uh, you kind of need to read this if you're into sonnet sequences. I mean, the sequencing isn't incredibly great, you know, but I still, I mean, it's a sonnet sequence. That's not the goal is the, the great sequencing. Even one of my favorite, um, I don't know if it's one of my favorite sequences, but it's a great, it's a great sequence, I think, or like a great bunch of poems. Uh, yeah, that, that's a better way to word it. A great bunch of poems. Michael Drayton's Idea Sonnets. Um, that's another one that's lacking in the sequencing department. But great. Great stuff. Very playful, you know, sense. I forgot what the link was between Dunn and Drayton. But it's helpful to contrast them in personality, right? Dunn is addressing his sonnets to God. So what he'll do is he'll bargain with God a lot of the time, right? He'll... Um, it's a weird sort of version of the sequence that we get with him because whereas Michael Drayton is trying to uh, manipulate his lover, Don is trying to manipulate God himself. And he is, you can feel him kind of snapping in some of these sonnets and like he's really, he really means this shit, John Don, when he says it. It's, it's awesome. Whereas Drayton, you can never trust a word out of his mouth. But Don, he's breaking as he's writing this stuff and it's really interesting to read for that reason. Um, his personality is really engaging. I feel like we, I mean, I hope we all read, have read Don's poetry, so I shouldn't need to talk about it that much, but it's quite good. Um, I'm trying to think how I can criticize it. I mean, it's just a bunch of really solid sonnets. I mean, what do you want? You know, um, he's sure he's not as dense as Sydney. Um, sure, his conceits aren't as clever as Sidney, but earnest poetry, to a degree. I mean, he is trying to bargain with God. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's some serious cojones to Don's poetry that I admire as well. But um, what else did I read? Pamphylia to Ampelanthus, I'm reading that. That's pretty good. I'm going to have to pause on it. I'm reading Willard and his bowling trophies again right now. And that's going great. I'm getting more out of it this time. Oh yeah, thanks to Chris. Uh, he commented on one of my videos and, and sent me uh, an incredible freaking album. <laughs> an incredible album. Um, it's a li Live in 77 by... I'm not going to say it now because the next, the next album recommendations video... And I'm going to keep doing those ones that fit into neatly packaged boxes you know five album recommendations i'm gonna keep doing that but i want to find something i can do you know just for me in the middle 
but it'll be in the next five albums video for sure. It's incredible. It's like a psych rock album that is um, uh, informally anti-capitalist because it's not short, uh, neatly packaged songs. It's all live recording. There's a lot going on. It's a really like anarchist uh, um, Japanese rock band. I'll link it in the video description. It's it's something, man. It's something, it's steaming my glasses up. That's how, that's how much of a something it is. Anyways, I probably said a whole lot of nothing. I don't really care. And, um, you know, what have you been reading? What have you been listening to? Thanks. I, uh, I should probably just get to thinking about the channel more. But that idea of, like, the channel is kind of weird to me itself. You know, thinking of my videos as stuff is very weird to me. I've, it's been causing a lot of, I don't know, you know. But on, on the other hand, I am sort of immortalizing a lot of what's going on. You know, I, it's, it's tough to read so many sonnets where, you know, uh, so long lives this, uh, uh, so long as men can breathe and eyes, eyes can see, so long, or something lives, whatever. This is living, this sonnet is living, and this gives life to thee. I'm kind of immortalizing all my stupidity here, you know? I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> um, but that's another thing that's been on my mind. But uh, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Ramble on, ramble on. That's how she go. Peace and groupie.